Hello everybody, welcome to Dry Dock episode 143. This week the questions are taken from the guide to USS Omaha, guide 203, as well as the accompanying Wednesday video on the Battle of Cape Matapan. Let's begin. Randomly Entertaining asks, why did navies believe that two to four single medium caliber, i.e. three to five inch guns, was a sufficient defense against aircraft, and did any ships break that trend early on? Partially it's because a lot of the ships that were being so fitted had not been designed with much, if anything, in the way of anti-aircraft armament, and adding more guns, which are of themselves relatively heavy, plus their ammunition, plus their crews, plus the supply train for the ammunition, etc., plus finding space for all of that, all on a ship that was never designed for that, was actually quite difficult. And, of course, AA guns tend to go somewhat high in the ship, which magnifies their effects on stability. And so, without a full refit-style upgrade, such as was allowed in the Washington Treaty with the 3,000 tons additional displacement for that purpose, it was somewhat difficult to slap on some extra AA guns um, for pre-existing ships. For ships that were being built at the time the aircraft started to become uh, recognised as any kind of serious threat, i.e. the very l the latter part of World War One and then into the 1920s, aircraft at that point weren't seen as a particularly large threat. Pretty much for that entire time period, aircraft were slow. They were not particularly um, strong. They were quite fragile. There weren't that many of them in terms of sh aircraft that could reach out to sea, and they had a relatively short range. The ones that could come out of significant distance were kind of big flying boats and such, which made rather obvious targets, and the smaller, lighter attack aircraft that might stand a chance through dodging, etc. As I say, the, the short range, and even once the carriers started to come in, the carrier conversions, uh, like Akagi or Lexington or even Courageous and Glorious, weren't really ready until the latter part of the 1920s. And so during all of that time, and even once they came into service, the chances of actually encountering any significant number of aircraft at sea that could even theoretically pose a significant threat was pretty minimal. Most navies had taken one look at Billy Mitchell's tests and dismissed them rightly for the stunt that they were. Plus you had the fact that uh, at that point you had a lot of ships with fighters based on catapult launchers on their turrets, at least in terms of the larger ships, and a human-guided anti-bomber unit, i.e. a fighter, was generally considered a far better and more effective form of air defence than some anti-aircraft guns on the deck, which obviously without anti-aircraft fire control systems etc. were not exactly the world's most accurate. So the idea was, yeah, you'd have a few machine guns for absolute close range uh, defence and some of these larger guns and hopefully the idea was you could either put up enough flak bursts to deter the attack or if you did get the occasional random hit a three to five inch shell would be large enough to total one of these tiny fragile biplanes and even once those big carrier conversions came in given that there were relatively few of them you could maybe expect an enemy carrier so once you took a away the fighters from the component because obviously they usually wouldn't be doing an attack you would be looking at maybe 30 to 40 aircraft maximum coming in and between hopefully your own carriers fighters your own ships um, catapult launched fighters etc plus you know two to four guns on every single ship spread throughout the fleet plus maneuvering it seemed a fairly safe bet to assume that that would be enough to deter and destroy incoming attacks. Especially given that at the time the speed of advance of aircraft was such that you could reliably see an attack coming and launch a fighter defence of some description before they got into range. It's only really in the 1930s as carriers start to proliferate and the types of aircraft they have aboard are starting to get more and more capable that people start to think of carriers and 
general aircraft as a whole as being something of a more significant threat to ships and that's why you tend to see slightly greater levels of anti-aircraft guns being installed in the 30s and then obviously onwards. Eamon asks, I was re-watching your guide to the county class and you mentioned that they had belt armour added during modernisation projects in the 30s. Was this a case of fitted for but not with or a happy accident? Because that amount of armour added should have added considerable weight to the ship. Now without further archive visits, which of course will have to happen post-Covid, I can't 100% prove it definitively because I haven't had kind of a smoking gun statement in some previously secret file about the county class where they've openly discussed it but I think that on the balance of available evidence it's fairly clear at least to me and a number of other historians I've spoken to that this is a, an early case of very definitely fitted for but not with and you can generally tell when that fitting has taken place because pre-refit uh, the county class has a double row of portholes or scuttles as you can see in this photo of HMS London but after that you either see much fewer um, on the lower row or none at all and that's because the armour plate play is in place. In fact, if you look at that famous photo of HMS Sussex that's taken a kamikaze hit on its armour, you can actually see at that point it's close enough in, you can see the blanked off um, porthole covers. Now, the reason I say it's very likely that this was planned from the start is because the county class, as you can see, are a fairly high freeboard, high riding uh, cruiser type. And they're very good sea boats as a result, incidentally. They've got a good level of armament, um, they've got a good range, they've got a good speed. The only thing they seem to be deficient on in their original configuration with the box arm around the magazines is protection. And it means that the county class is competitive with ships like the Hipper, which is considerably over the treaty limits. But when you look at the speed at which these refits were undertaken and how quickly UK armour manufacturing industry seemed to be ready for this. I mean, with the best will in the world, British industry is not usually that efficient. Um, the, the fact that it just happens so quickly and precisely and methodically in and of itself raises flags in a lot of respects. And on top of that, you've got to consider that, again, whilst this is only part of the puzzle, at least to me, when you look at most photos of pre-refit county class, wherever they are, whether they're at home or overseas, much like this uh, photo of London, you notice they tend to be riding slightly high. You can see the um, below waterline paint to varying degrees in a lot of them, and relatively substantial amounts of it. I mean, you see that sometimes in other ships, um, especially during peacetime, but usually not quite as commonly and usually not quite to that same extent. Whereas once you see the photos of the county class in their refitted configuration, you notice that they're pretty much sitting at the waterline. And that's, bearing in mind, this is mostly taking place during um, wartime, these photos. That's with all the other additions that they've had as well. So if with all those additions they're now sitting at the waterline, that suggests to me that whoever designed them knew that in their as-built configurations they were not actually riding at the point that they were supposed to. Additionally, when they had these refits, their overall performance doesn't seem to have suffered much, if at all. Uh, even with, as, as well as the armour refit, the addition of other wartime systems, as I mentioned. Whereas, if you look at, ironically enough, given the subject of this photo, HMS London in her full modernization rebuild state, where she got a miniature Queen Anne mansion superstructure, amongst other things, she did suffer quite a bit of problems, which is the kind of problems you would expect from massively overloading a design that theoretically had been built to right up to the limit. So that tells me that, yes, it was entirely possible to ruin a county-class cruiser by overloading it, but simultaneously it seems that just infilling that gap with more armour plating to make a, a fully belted heavy cruiser doesn't seem to have done so. And given the extremely tight margins that most treaty-era ships were built to, uh, 
if the counties had in fact been built right up to that treaty limit without this in place, you would expect something more like HMS London to happen to all of them, and it didn't. So hopefully you can see my reasoning on that. But as I say, it's it's one of the many, many things that I will be doing more delving into in the archives when I get the opportunity, hopefully later this year. Freight Lurker asks, you've mentioned in a few videos that the Russian Navy was extremely hard on its loaned ships. Why? I think there's a few reasons. For one thing, these ships, as far as the Russians are concerned, are unique. So in the Royal Navy, for example, Royal Sovereign is one of a class of five, at least at the start. And for the Americans, the Omaha class that they lend them is also a class, one of a class. So there is a broad range of experience in how to operate them, training and how to maintain them, etc. Whereas in Russia, they're one-offs. And they're one-offs that have been rapidly introduced with not a tremendous amount of, of previous um, training or anticipation. Therefore, they are not going to necessarily have the skill base to maintain them um, as much. Additionally, these ships are, of course, foreign ships. They're using foreign components. They're using, in, especially in the case of the British ships, foreign units of measurement, uh, imperial, um, actually for the Americans as well at that point, uh, as opposed to the Russians who at this point are not using um, British imperial or American imperial measurements. A lot of the instructions that are built into the ships, uh, i.e. In, literally engraved on various uh, panels and guns, etc., are going to be in a language that perhaps not many of them understand, and some of those who do may not understand it completely, although obviously you would have Russian sailors who did understand English, or, oh well, English or American, I guess there's the same thing. And ultimately, the Russians knew that these were loaned vessels. They knew they were going to have to give them back, and they were going to have to give them back, in theory within what you might otherwise classify as a single maintenance cycle, or at least if you stretched it, a single maintenance cycle. And so I also think there was a certain degree of... The, the same kind of factor that leads to this old good old saying, the fastest car you've ever driven is a rental. Yeah. The Russians didn't have to worry about these ships' long-term upkeep. They didn't have to worry about repairing them afterwards. They were literally just something to sail around and potentially use for a short while so as long as they stayed afloat and kept mobile why would they care that much about keeping them in tip-top condition frank damaris asks i've read in some less reliable sources that uss richmond scored a hit on nachi at the Komondorsky island battle but other sources are silent on that issue are there any reliable sources that confirm that hit and why did Richmond cease firing early in the fight dash pursuit, since the turret guns can range out to 25,000 yards, and if Salt Lake City and the Japanese cruisers were firing and scoring occasional hits from much beyond that, then they'd be in contention for longest range naval hit. Probably the most authoritative way of figuring out who hit what and where at Komodorsky Island would be to look at Nachi's damage record, or damage report, but unfortunately... Well, one, given the state of Japanese naval records at the time, I don't even know if it survived. And two, if it did, I haven't been able to find it. But as you say, the the, the one unquestioned thing is Nachi was hit repeatedly. Exactly who hit Nachi and with what is an entirely different matter. Um, I went through the various sources that I have and some say it was Richmond, some with six inch shells, some say it was destroyers with five inch shells others say it was salt lake city with eight inch shells so for the moment i'm going to put my hands up and have to say pass nachi was hit repeatedly but that's really all uh, i can say definitively on that as far as why richmond ceased firing a good part of that is that whilst yes the turret guns could just about range out to that level the casement guns couldn't. They had a much more limited elevation and much more limited range, and the battle had drawn out of range of the casement guns, which would have left Richmond with only its turrets available to fire, and obviously given that at that stage of the battle it was very much a back and forth, it wasn't a full-on broadside engagement, probably meant that most of the time they would have only had one turret with two guns left to fire with. And of course... As I've covered before, having two guns firing doesn't really help you all that much in terms of getting an accurate range. It 
it could score a hit theoretically but and later on Richmond would during the engagement still be firing with one or both of its turrets as things changed there's notes talking about the control for firing actually passing back and forth between its two main fire control directors but at that point it was mostly nuisance value more than anything else very speculative fire and on top of that the battle a it it did take a fairly long time but b it was fairly clear fairly early on that it probably would be a fairly long battle at which point blazing away with your guns at extreme range where with very few guns where you're very unlikely to actually hit anything is a very easy way to waste a lot of ammo you might later find yourself needing. Tevildo asks, with the references to protected cruisers and flotilla leaders in this video, which types of warships do you consider to be the least effective for their time, leaving aside one-off bad designs like HMS Captain? I'd actually say the two least effective types of warships in my estimation both fall into roughly the same category of time period that being the pre-dreadnought period and they are the second class battleship and the third class protected cruiser the second class battleship i think is a bit of a stupid idea because generally speaking if you are looking at who is buying second class battleships you're either going to be a nation that cannot afford a full scale battleship and just wants to have a battleship for the sake of having one or you are a very large navy and you're buying them as effectively cheap foreign station ships like the royal navy for example the problems with the these two ideas is that if you are the smaller navy you're actually far better off buying a fairly powerful armored cruiser because it's likely that that armored cruiser has roughly the same level of firepower as a second class battleship it's going to be a lot faster and therefore a lot more mobile and it's probably actually going to have similar levels of protection maybe maybe just slightly less but ultimately it's going to have more than enough protection to deal with anything else that it might come across in the vicinity uh, assuming you're going after powers of a roughly similar scale to your own and ultimately if you're going after someone much bigger than you whether it's a big armored cruiser or a second class battleship isn't really going to help you win but again having an armored cruiser might allow you to at least get away so there's no real point in having them as a small navy i think and for a larger navy like the british again they don't serve all that much purpose because yes they might be might be more powerful than the average cruiser that your enemy might have in that far distant station but that assumes that the enemy cruiser comes to you because a second class battleship is usually going to be slower than the enemy cruisers so it can act in a defensive role fine as a port guard ship or something like that or escorting a convoy but you could do that with cruisers big armored cruisers better you could do that with shore fortifications even better you could do that with old obsolete guard ships better the expense because a second class battleship is still expensive that you go through for getting something that can't run down its prey and is just powerful enough that its prey is going to just stay away from it is not really worth it in my opinion much better to just get let's say either more armored cruisers or just not get them at all the third class protected cruiser similarly earns my ire because they are incredibly poorly armed to the point that armed merchant cruisers for all the stick they get about being basically pointless against any real warship which often is true would actually stand a semi-decent chance against most third class cruisers yeah okay the third class cruiser might be a fraction faster but if you're talking about an armed merchant cruiser made up of a, an ocean liner that's probably not true but the third class cruisers are often not only armed with small guns but also shorter ranged weaker 
small guns as compared to, let's say, uh, a, a second class cruiser. So in a gunfight, you've got about the same level of practical protection as you know, an armed merchant cruiser. You've probably got the same gun number of guns. In fact, the armed merchant cruiser might have heavier guns because it's physically larger. So they might have given it some old six inch guns instead of you tooling around with your four or 4.7 inch guns. And you, you're not really going to be able to run away. You can't meaningfully fight even a second class enemy protected cruiser because it's going to outgun and outrange you and outrun you. If you if you want a military looking vessel for the for keeping an eye on the locals and checking commercial shipping, you might as well go with a gunboat. The third class cruiser has no real value that you can't get out of a gunboat, except for the fact that it's maybe a fraction more impressive. Although that's a very tenuous argument. So I would say, yeah, those two are the least effective for their time, which is why I still hold that the um, the Battle of Zanzibar with HMS Pegasus is still a very black mark in the Royal Navy's book, not because the outcome itself was particularly surprising, but because the outcome was so easy to predict, um, i.e. no one's particularly shocked that Pegasus lost, to Königsberg, but at the same time, they should never have been in the position where it was such a hilariously one-sided fight. There, there was literally no point to Pegasus being there, um, and really, I would say no point to Pegasus. Yeah, the Royal Navy needed lots of ships, but they would have been much better served getting a few more second-class protected cruisers and a bunch of gunboats. James D asks, how big a difference did shell calibre make? And as a connected question, how capable were the King George V class battleships? I think I've mentioned this somewhat in another video somewhere. It does ring a bell, but effectively it comes down to what are you shooting at, assuming we're talking about battleships. Because the size of the shell itself is related to usually armor penetration but it's not exclusively so i do think one major overlooked portion of shells especially battleship shells is the bursting charge i how much explosive is actually aboard that shell so when it arrives inside the target there is a correlation between that and how much damage it's going to do i mean having several dozen pounds of explosive arrive aboard is not a good thing in any circumstance but i think it's fairly obvious that if the one shell contains 50 percent more explosive it's going to be scattering shell fragments and shock waves through your ship with a considerably greater degree of enthusiasm than a smaller payload shell now that's one half of the equation so you could in theory then look at a shell and go well this shell may be two inches smaller in caliber but it contains considerably more explosive therefore it's going to do more damage therefore it's actually a better shell however this is where the armor penetration question comes in and again it's not strictly related to shell caliber size although there is some correlation because obviously you can have differences in the design of shell you can have differences in the performance of the gun that's firing the shell so you take for example the US Mark 8 shell, the 16 inch shell, it had two very different performance lines depending on if it was fired from a 16 inch 45 or a 16 inch 50 gun. Um, so there are a lot of variables in that sense and where you have to start worrying about that is when you're shooting against heavily armoured targets. Against some, if you're taking a battleship up against something like a cruiser, a battle cruiser, or anything that size or smaller, a carrier then i would say your shell caliber doesn't matter anywhere near as much as your bursting charge because say that's going to do them more damage but if you're going up against heavily armored targets the first question is does the gun or well the gun shell combination have the power to penetrate the enemy ship's vitals once it gets to that point and it can comfortably at a decent battle range penetrate most if not all of the enemy's vital parts 
then you don't need to go any larger. Um, this is actually one of the reasons, one of many reasons, why the US stuck with 16-inch guns even though they had 18-inch guns in the works and did consider them a number of times, simply because you didn't need an 18-inch shell because the targets that they were firing could be hit and penetrated just as comfortably by a 16-inch shell and a 16-inch shell meant you could have more guns. Uh, I'd say there, there's a whole load, load of other reasons, but that's just one of them. So when you're looking at something like the King George V class with the 14-inch gun, I'd say consider your target. Can the 14-inch gun penetrate the target at a reasonable battle range? If so, then I would default back to your bursting charge is probably the more important of the two. However, if you're coming up against a really heavily armoured target and your choice is, say, a 14-inch 45 caliber gun versus a 15-inch 52 caliber gun or a 16-inch 50 caliber gun, then the larger calibers start to make a lot more sense because they will actually go through. And, okay, if you've got a smaller bursting charge, so be it, but at least you're getting into the enemy's vitals and exploding and doing damage, whereas a theoretical shell with a larger bursting charge from a smaller caliber weapon might not get through in the first place, at which point that all that extra explosive is useless. Scott Mason asks... I was wondering if you would ever do a review of any sci-fi ships, e.g. ships from Star Wars or Warhammer 40k. Well, I did of course cover the Emperor-class battleship in last year's April the 1st video. Um, I've thought about it at times, but to be perfectly honest, there are a few good 40k lore channels out there. There's a few decent Star Trek lore channels, or at least... Um, channels that cover Star Trek ships etc or Star Wars ships or whatever as part of their thing and yeah I think I could do a pretty good job of those I mean as you might have guessed yes I am a massive sci-fi nerd so yeah I could do Babylon 5, Stargate, Star Trek, Star Wars 40k quite happily no problem but pretty much all of those there's already people doing them and in some cases they have the graphic skills to quite easily outdo me and whilst I think at least from a you know talking perspective uh, putting a nice exciting spin on the law perspective I think I could do a pretty decent job of it all but there's only so many hours in the day I like doing naval history it takes up a fair amount of time doing naval history and therefore it's kind of why would I go and then try and compete in a market that has I think a little bit more saturation when it comes to competing channels that's not to say I would never consider doing it but it would be very much a side project or side hobby if I somehow found myself with endless amounts of free time on my hands which I don't see happening anytime soon but as those of you who are on Discord occasionally will know, I'm perfectly happy to chat about sci-fi stuff, especially 40k. If you ever happen to be on the Discord, and who knows, maybe one of these days one of the uh, 40k channels might ask me over to come and have a chat with them or something. You never know, might be fun. Red14 asks, if Cunningham had towed Polar back to Alexandria, what would have been done with her? I'm sure the British would have had little interest in trying to operate a completely non-standard cruiser that presumably wouldn't even have been able to fire British Patton 8-inch shells, but perhaps she would have been handed over to the Greek Navy? I think the first thing that would have happened is that she would have been completely swarmed by Royal Navy officers and men, and once they'd finished looting the ship, um, she would have been swarmed again by more Royal Navy officers and men actually trying to uh, discern if there were any secrets that could be gained from her whether that be in the forms of examining her communications equipment her guns her engines her general design principles basically she would have become something of an intel treasure trove for a good long while after that it would depend on how much effort the allies thought they could put into repairing her because she obviously was damaged um if they'd thought that she could be repaired and put back into service with relatively little effort compared to making good similar kinds of damage, i.e. it didn't cost an absolute fortune, 
Yeah, you're right. I don't think the British would have had a particular interest in operating a single one-off heavy cruiser. But if there were elements of other Allied navies who maybe might have wanted to operate a one-off heavy cruiser of some description, then, um, yeah, I don't see why they wouldn't have handed her over to one of those. As you say, the Greek navy would be a fairly strong candidate for that. But I suspect that probably would have been towards the end of the war, once the whole, you know, taking the ship apart for intelligence, then putting it back together, then repairing it, etc., would have been done, at which point it would be partly handing it over to an Allied Navy to assist in the war, and partly kind of an early reparations kind of deal. Although, at the same time, given that there was a free Italian Navy, or effectively equivalent thereof, Italian co-belligerent Navy, technically speaking, after Italy bowed out of the war in 1943, it's possible, assuming some kind of relatively sane timeline, that she might actually have been handed back over to the Italian co-belligerent navy for a while, so that they have a ship that they're familiar with to operate. UNSC Forward on to Dawn asks, I've read that many naval experts consider the Italian modernisation of their World War One era battleships to have been a waste of time and resources. Do you agree with them? And if so, what would you have done instead to prepare the Italian Navy for war in the 1930s? I think there's two aspects to this. The first is, as a technical exercise, were they a success and worth doing? And from that perspective, I think yes, definitely. Um, both, both classes of battleship that were upgraded became significantly more successful. They are probably the single most comprehensive modernizations of battleships in the actually to be honest p period because they got well more powerful guns even if they lost some of them and they got faster and they had secondary battery revisions and they became somewhat better protected the whole hull form changed entirely where so th basically the jumping capability if you took Conte de Cavour for example in its as-built state and its revised state, it's a hugely, hugely more capable vessel. Whereas if you look at, say, the US standards refits, they were more capable. But if you took West Virginia on December 6th, 1941, and compared it to West Virginia on December 6th, 1944, whilst she is considerably more capable in terms of her anti-aircraft fit etc and of course fire control those are systems you could retrofit or install without the modernization um, and so therefore in terms of the actual upgrades done during the modernization the percentage increase in power of the Cavour is greater and likewise actually even with the Queen Elizabeth class because the Queen Elizabeth class didn't get any faster. Granted, they did get a bit better protected, but so did Cavour. And the Queen Elizabeth class didn't get any more heavily armed. Granted, they did get some increased elevation so they could shoot further, but nothing about the material properties of the guns actually changed, whereas with the Cavours and, um, uh, and the other Italian battleship class, they did get more capable with the boring out of the guns, etc., so again, whilst uh, 1944 West Virginia or Queen Elizabeth Valiant or Warspite would have a decisive advantage in battle against a modernised Italian battleship, the percentage increase is in lethality is less because, let's face it, those classes had an advantage against the Cavours originally as well. <laughs> Now, the other aspect to it is, was this worth doing in terms of who they ended up fighting? And I think that's a very different question. And that is where I think a certain degree of hindsight colouring perception might be coming into play. Because, yes, you can make the on-paper argument that it was a waste of time and resources because they ended up fighting ships like I said like the Queen Elizabeth refits and other ships like uh, Nelson was in the Mediterranean etc they either ended up fighting or could have ended up fighting ships that were broadly more capable than them 
or and sometimes just significantly and flat out outright more capable than them at which point yeah you can then say oh well if they end up fighting more numerous battleships and those battleships have the advantage over them it was obviously just a waste of time however that's what happened that's not why those upgrades were made the italians didn't go oh yes we're going to take our 12 inch battleships and spend millions and millions of lira upgrading them just so that they can still be at a disadvantage against the royal navy the italians were looking at primarily the french and when you look at them in that light i the kind of why were they built or rebuilt it makes an awful lot more sense because yes the french were building the Richelieu's, the Italians were building the Littorios. So who in the Italian scheme of things would they have faced off against? The Britannias and the Dunkirks. And against the Britannias, the refitted Italian battleships definitely would have had a massive advantage. Even against Dunkirk and Strasbourg, I'd say there's probably a decent chance of a fair fight the the italian ships are not all that much slower thanks to their speed upgrades and yes the french battleships do have more powerful guns the italians have slightly more guns but combined with that relative lack of armor on dunkirk and strasbourg it's still not a not a particularly one-sided fight and of course, if the Italians are building the Torios, the French are building the Dunkirks, it means the Italian battle line is now a fast battle line, which means the Britannias might not get a look in anyway, at which point, in theory, there would be four Italian refitted battleships compared to two Dunkirks, whilst the Torios and the Richelieu's fight it out. So from a planning perspective, from who the Italians thought they were going to fight and the capabilities of that theoretical enemy, I'd say the the Italian refits were definitely worth it and definitely made an awful lot of sense. It's just, as happened with an awful lot of navies in World War II, they ended up fighting someone that they had not thought about fighting much, if at all. And, yeah, okay, in that respect, it didn't work out quite as well for them as they thought. Isingboren, I think, asks... I recently watched your video on The Last Stand of Revenge, where you mentioned the use of castles on the ships to repel boarding. I was curious, what caused navies to depart from this design idea? I assume the growing strength of cannon and the stability cost resulting from such structures were the primary reasons. Yep, those reasons are definitely valid and part of the reason why the castles gradually went away. Part of it was also the fact that because gunnery was becoming more and more important to ships, it was going from boarding as the primary method of combat and, in some cases, fire a gun or a battery of guns and then board, which was kind of the standard tactics of most of the Spanish ships at that point, over to fire repeated broadsides to batter the enemy down and then either they surrender or you board them once you've badly weakened them. All of a sudden, speed and agility mattered a lot more, especially to the English who were fighting at a disadvantage versus the sheer size of naval forces that the Spanish or later the French, etc., could bring to bear. So if you had a ship that was armed mostly with guns and was aiming to knock apart the enemy ship or its crew before doing anything like boarding, then you needed to be able to maneuver away from a bigger heavier ship that might be trying to board you you needed to be able to outrun a fleet that might be coming after you and obviously a high forecastle and after castle might also induce quite a bit of drag as well as the stability issues and so the castles gradually became more and more cut down and of course if you're thinking mostly not entirely but mostly uh, uh, in terms of boarding as something that happens to other people then the need for defensive castles from which to fight enemy boarding becomes a significantly l lesser concern in your overall consideration of how you're designing a ship. Plus, of course, if you cut down the castles, as you mentioned, that means you've not only preserved more stability, but also more weight and or displacement. And with that, you can equip more guns, both on your gun decks, but also 
on your upper decks, your weather deck, with which you can then hopefully try and resist fire as well. Plus the increasing proliferation of guns meant that the defensive properties of the castles were becoming less and less because you can't build them especially heavily because you know they're very high up and quite voluminous so whilst a castle might keep out a arrow quite easily um, perhaps also might stop the early portable firearms pistols and such like um, and certainly slow down an arquebus and give you shelter anyway as well because it's much more difficult to tell where the person is if someone's got even something like a falconet or a minion or a swivel gun or anything like that they can quite easily put grape shot or round shot straight through a castle which means at that point you've just created a killing box so once again the defensive value of the castle is diminished so by taking away the castle you have more guns on a faster more agile ship and that suits the new era of primarily gun-based combat much better than the old high castles because there were a few experiments with arming the castles themselves with more guns but it turns out well one because they're much more lightly built you can't fit as heavy guns and two even if you did make them heavily built you still can't fit many heavy guns because of the stability concerns that you mentioned. Aaron Levi asks why do some people call the Alaska class battle cruisers and not large cruisers? I think it's partly semantics, partly that legitimately there is a an argument to be made one side or the other. It's just a case of which particular argument you think is slightly stronger. And I covered this in brief in my five minute guide to the Alaska class. But when you look at the Alaska class as a whole, you can see elements of both a very large cruiser and a battle cruiser. So, for example, if you were going to make an argument that the Alaska class are battle cruisers, you'd look at it and go, okay, what's their mission? Their mission is to hunt down and kill any cruiser. So they've got to be as fast or faster, and they've got to have superior weaponry. Well, that is the mission profile of the Invincible class battle cruisers, the first one. So, okay, that matches up. Armor-wise, well, the Invincibles carried on the armor of the Minotaur-class armored cruisers. The Alaska-class, likewise, carry the armor and torpedo defense as a direct evolution of the Baltimore-class cruisers. So, again, this checks out. It's a, basically a big cruiser hull with some much bigger guns. Speed-wise, the Invincibles were at faster than armored cruisers around about as fast as some of the absolute fastest protected cruisers but generally faster than most cruisers alaska class pretty much sits in that same bracket so yep all seems to be good for battle cruisers so far but then you can also turn it around and say okay well what features make it more of a large cruiser not a battle cruiser so in that respect you can look at it from a perspective of well the battle cruisers started off around about the same size and displacement as battleships and as time went on grew to be in many cases actually even larger than them the alaska class are definitively not i mean they're big but they're not iowa big and iowa and montana are the contemporary designs for the alaskas additionally the armament whilst impressive and whilst at 12 inches is also exactly the same caliber as the first battle cruisers is not entirely representative of the battle cruiser design concept because the battle cruisers of World War One were designed with the same level of armament in terms of caliber as contemporary battleships, just fewer of them. Whereas the Alaskas, whilst the 12-inch gun is a very powerful gun, it's still not as powerful as a 16-inch gun, and it is not a 16-inch gun, which is the contemporary battleship gun for american ships at this point and additionally the alaskas carry nine which is exactly the same as the north carolina south dakota and iowa classes granted it's three guns less than the montanas but still so if you were expecting an alaska to be a battle cruiser variant of say a south dakota well it might 
dis it would need to displace a few thousand tons more and if it was a battle cruiser version of the Iowas it would have to displace probably uh, maybe 10,000 tons more and to follow the classic battle cruiser pattern you'd expect it to carry maybe a renowned style um, three twin turrets with 16 inch guns instead of three triples with 12s. But the other thing you have to bear in mind is that that's comparing the Alaskas to the first battle cruisers and what made a battle cruiser thereafter changed quite a bit. You had the German design style of battle cruisers come in, you had advances on battle cruiser design from the British, so the Lions went not to full battleship protection, but they went to protection that was designed to stand up against the capital ship guns of the German battle cruisers because they were smaller than the 13.5s and 15 inch that the British were fielding at the time. You then see the slight aberration that was the Renowns, and then you see Hood, which really is a fast battleship, but people call battle cruiser for various reasons. And the, the battle cruiser concept evolves and then merges into the fast battleship concept in reality. So, given that the Alaskas are a World War II design and not a World War I or pre World War I design, I think when you look at the Alaskas as a whole, although it's probably on balance fair to say that they embody most, not all, but most of the concepts of the first generations of battle cruisers, the Invincibles and, and Indefatigables, they are not representative of what a battle cruiser is by the time you get to World War II. And so at that point, in in that time context, it is more appropriate to call them a large cruiser. The funny thing is, actually, that when you look at what constitutes a battle cruiser by the time of the 1930s and 1940s, you can actually make an almost, not entirely, but almost watertight argument for saying the Iowas are, in fact, battle cruisers. But that's another discussion. Brad asks, what lessons were learned for future Royal Navy aircraft carrier engagements from the Tondern raid in 1918? And for those of you who aren't aware, the Tondern raid was an attack by seven Sopwith camels equipped with bombs on German Zeppelin sheds launched from aircraft carriers in the North Sea. Now, as far as lessons learned, well, one of the most immediate ones was they were using HMS Furious, and even though it had a aft landing deck at this point, they were still in a position of having to ditch aircraft and recover the pilots which ended up with the loss of one of the um, aircraft with its pilot because they ran out of fuel early. So there were some lessons in terms of needing either needing longer-ranged aircraft or needing to be closer to the target because fuel starvation was a big risk. Also, you know, you need a full flight deck to be able to get your aircraft to come into land. Those things were, were very much learned. The concept of air attack on an enemy base was obviously validated, and the idea of an aircraft carrier being an effective weapon was also therefore validated, although there had been some other aircraft carrier operations that had kind of indicated things this way. And the thing is, if, and again, this is my personal interpretation, I know if there are a few historians who disagree with this, but there are some others who are kind of of the vaguely similar opinion, but the fact that the Tondern raid was pretty much the penultimate well, it was the last big or any Royal Navy carrier strike of the First World War. It may have set the fleet air arm off on a slightly um, interesting tangent, at least for a while, because it was a strike against shore installations. And you see this even to an extent when you get as far as Taranto and especially the Norwegian campaign, where the fleet air arm is striking shipping but it's also trying to strike land-based targets with elements of the strike package at Taranto you have some swordfish carrying bombs for this purpose and in the Norwegian campaign there, there's quite a lot of fleet air activity trying to you know be a seaborne strategic bomber wing effectively and it doesn't really work because unless you have sort of wall-to-wall -wall carriers, i.e. the Pacific in the last couple of years of World War II, 
carrier-borne strike aircraft just don't carry the same kind of payload that land-based aircraft can. And so it would have been slightly better in those circumstances for the Royal Navy to concentrate on attacking shipping. Now, granted, there's a few cases in Norway where they are the only air support available. So, of course, use what you've got rather than hope for what you haven't. But I think if the next planned operation had gone ahead with uh, for the Royal Navy carrier strikes in World War One, that probably would have put the Royal Navy on a much, much firmer footing when it came to its interwar carrier doctrine and then how they executed that in the Second World War. And for those of you who don't know about that, that was a plan to hit the high seas fleet in its anchorages with torpedo bombers, something that, you know, Taranto is basically a slightly updated and revised version of that plan. However, that particular plan to attack the high seas fleet was immense because they didn't have to worry well dive bombers hadn't been invented so you couldn't take dive bombers and because they didn't have to worry much about fighter response they didn't send they weren't planning on sending fighters they're instead planning to send about 100 to 120 torpedo bombers in a massed strike and to give you some idea of the potential devastation that could cause i mean obviously we are talking about World War One era aircraft, but the attack on Pearl Harbor only actually involved 40 torpedo bombers. Everything else was fighters or carrying bombs. So we're talking about a, at least numerically, torpedo strike three times the size of that that was launched at Pearl Harbor. And outside of Arizona, most of the dis actual destruction to shipping was caused by torpedoes. If that had gone ahead, and the main reason it didn't go ahead was because production of the Cuckoo torpedo bomber hadn't reached the numbers sufficient to actually launch it by the time the war ended, if that had gone ahead, I think it would have been a bit of a two-edged sword because it would have emphasised to the Royal Navy that actually this is a far more cost-effective use of your time and aircraft, which would have been good and informed the Royal Navy strategy going on a lot more strongly. On the other hand, it would have demonstrated to everyone in 1919, that, or, or possibly earlier if the cuckoo production had gotten off the ground, that attacking an enemy fleet in harbour with torpedo craft was entirely possible. And Wilhelmshaven is not exactly the world's deepest harbour either, which means that come World War II, when you've got things like Pearl Harbour and Taranto happening, they may not be as successful as they were historically because everyone knows now that this is possible and therefore more stringent measures to guard against such things probably would have been taken. Matt Blom asks, the 180mm turrets used on the Russian Kirov-class cruisers, these are the 1930s ones, appear to be horrifically engineered with terrible dispersion, poor barrel life and low rate of fire. How did this turret design possibly pass the engineering trial stage? So there's three main elements to why these guns ended up being yeah some pretty bad weapons first it has to be said it's the political situation in russia at the time um everything had to be glorious success for glorious revolution comrade and if you did not succeed well there was a chance that you might be you know forgiven the problem might be understood and you might be allowed to try and correct it, or you might be called a traitor to the revolution and an element of capitalist infiltration simply for not having a 100% success rate and sent to gulag or shot immediately. Um, as a result, it was fairly uncommon, unless designers absolutely knew and trusted their superiors, to report failure is just no everything is absolutely fine comrade everything will work perfectly comrade please don't shoot me comrade um this is the thing it, that kind of situation can be somewhat overblown sometimes in certain publications but it did exist and it's it's one of these things of if the situation has existed and is known to exist in some places then everyone else is going to be very very reticent even though some other um, design bureaus and such might be a little bit more understanding so you can point to instances where designs just didn't work and they say okay well we'll fix it but you can also point to instances where designs didn't work and people were immediately marched off for supposed treason anyway that's one element the second element was that the 180 mil or 7.1 inch guns were designed to have 
followed on from admittedly some very, very good Russian guns of the World War One period, which really went all in on the high velocity, mega kinetic energy, hyper armor piercing, uh, very flat trajectory uh, kind of school of thought. And they went a little bit too far, really. Um, they had hilariously short barrel life and the dispersion, as you said, was absolutely awful. They had to wind that back a little bit just to make them even something like usable. And thirdly, there's also what the gun was installed on, the ships themselves. The whole point of the 7.1, with the hypervelocity effectively, was to try and give ships with a displacement more along the lines of a medium-sized light cruiser, like the Kirovs, the firepower of something like a 10,000 ton heavy cruiser. Except with the idea being that because it was an intermediate stage between 6 and 8 inch, the 7.1 inch should have the kind of the armor piercing of an 8 inch gun, but the rate of fire of a 6 inch gun on a ship the size of a Leander class. And the idea, therefore, was we will have a superior cruiser. Uh, it turns out there's a reason for the various choices of armaments and ship sizes. And if you try and stick something like a 7.1 inch gun in a triple turret on a cruiser that is not a large 10,000 ton treaty compliant cruiser, you end up with an awful lot of problems where the turret is very, very cramped. And if the turret is very cramped, then you have real problems reloading it and keeping up the rate of fire. And that's why when you look at the different mounts, some of those mounts, they don't come quite close to six inch rate of fire, but they're getting within a reasonable shouting distance of the rate of fire of some 5.9 or six inch guns. But those tend to be single mounts, especially single open mounts, where people have the ability to move around. So it is possible to do with the gun, but in a very, very cramped triple turret crammed on top of a relatively small cruiser, it turns out not to be. And you suddenly end up with a ship that is armed with a shell that is physically smaller than an 8-inch, therefore carries a smaller bursting charge than an 8-inch, and because you've had to downrate it, its armor-piercing capability is not similar or greater than an 8-inch gun, except that you have a rate of fire that's actually worse than an 8-inch gun because everybody's crammed in this tiny turret. And, well, once you've you know, built the ship, there's not a lot else you can do. The only vaguely realistic solution at that point would have been to eliminate maybe the centre gun and oh, therefore open up a bit more space in the turret. But uh, that wasn't going to happen. They did make some additional improvements and efforts to try and correct the issue, but it, it, it's a mixture of a sunk cost fallacy, several different issues in the design process. The concept for which the ships themselves were designed just didn't really work with a smattering of, you know, political fear and terror, and you end up with the Kirovs. Matt Osborne asks, what individual naval uniform is your favourite, and why? Now, on this, I kind of have a rotating top three, depending on the mood as it strikes me. I really like 18th century, late 18th century Royal Navy officers' uniforms, minus the wigs. Um, they're actually surprisingly easy to fight with because of the relatively short cut of the jacket. They do actually allow you a fair bit of flexibility if you're going after somebody with a sword, which is always useful. And they also encourage you to keep in shape because, um, well, let's just say they'll make it very obvious if you've eaten one too many pies. The next one has to be the US Marine Corps full dress uniform. That is a superlative piece of design work. And the thing is, I can't tell whether the Babylon 5 uniforms were inspired by it, that, by it or whether I like the USMC uniform in part because I like Babylon 5. The jacket style is very similar uh, in some ways, and I really prefer that jacket style over the more these days usual in the western world um suit jacket that you normally see around 
I'm not a particular fan of dress whites because, well, I look at them and I think, yeah, if, if they're done properly, they look really, really good. But the practical person inside of me just goes, yeah, and the minute you so much as move, you're going to have dirt, smudges, creases, etc. It's going to be an absolute nightmare. So I, I don't like those on practicality grounds. The other uniform that I really actually like is the Russian Navy's um, great coat. Uh, of a uniform set because it looks like something that you could literally stick someone in that and then stick them on the bow of a ship in the middle of the arctic convoy and they'd probably still feel warm and that appeals to me for all oh, so many reasons texas and la shock asks what determines if a ship gets a uss prefix the two qualifications appear to be that it has to be a commissioned vessel of the United States Navy, so that's why U.S. Coast Guard vessels are not USS, despite the fact that they are owned by the government, they are not owned by the Navy specifically. And secondly, uh, as well as being a commissioned vessel in the U.S. Navy, they have to be manned by military personnel, so that's why Sealift Command gets USNS, uh, or similar. And this title only lasts as long as the ship is in commission. So when the ship is launched, it's not yet commissioned, so it's not actually USS at that point. And once the ship is removed from commission, it's also technically not USS at that point, unless special dispensation is given. And so that's it for this week, with the exception, if you've seen in the video description already, that there is a slight clarification dash correction um so you may recall of several dry docks ago now there was a question about why german submarines operated in the mediterranean under austro-hungarian flags in the early part of world war one uh, so i gave an answer there and um whilst the substantial part of that answer is correct there does need to be a little bit more clarification a few more points added and for that i obviously have to thank mr michael lowry who is of course the expert in world war one submarines who sent the sent me an email with the uh, comments so i shall read it to you so you have more naval information because this is always good um so he says although austria hungary and germany were ultimately at war with the same countries the start dates weren't always the same Austria, Hungary and Italy went to war on May 23rd, 1915. Italy and Germany don't officially go to war for another 15 months, August 28th, 1916. During those 15 months, the Germans felt bound to have their submarines attack Italian shipping if they came across it. In order to do that, they pretended to be Austro-Hungarian, and the Austro-Hungarians played along. Thus, all the German submarines in the Mediterranean had a false Austrian identity, and sometimes their numbers matched and sometimes they didn't. For example, German U-35 was also Austrian U-35, whilst a little German mine-laying boat UC-14 was given the Austro-Hungarian designation U-18. Yes, eventually everyone kind of knew what was going on. The loss of UC-12 whilst laying mines at Taranto was something of a giveaway. He then goes on to further explain, the false identities used by the German boats explains why Austro-Hungarian submarine numbers are so disjointed. Actual Austrian boats are U1 to U6, U15 to U17, U10, U11, U14, U20 to 23, U27 to 32, U40, U41, U43 and U47. The German UB-43 and UB-47, which were transferred from Germany after extensive use in the Mediterranean to Austrian ports. All the gaps are German boats, which have been given Austro-Hungarian designations. He also points out that diplomatically, which was one of the points I made back in my original answer, there was an issue in that the Austrians were somewhat more hesitant about engaging in completely unrestricted submarine warfare as compared to the Germans, which led to some tension between the two ostensible allies. So there you go, a little bit more information about German subs operating under Austro-Hungarian flags in World War I. Other than that, um, thank you very much everyone for listening, and just one, I guess, other clarification, which is when we're talking about if anyone wants to come and uh, watch me being battered by pole axes, warhammers and swords, or possibly me battering someone else with a pole axe, warhammer or sword at the Chalk Valley History Festival, um, me and the group that I do medieval reenactment with will be there in, uh, at the weekend 
of the event. We're not there through the entire week. Just a minor detail. But other than that, thank you very much for listening and hope to see you again in another video.